Moving along to our next keynote address, it's my pleasure to introduce Charles Evans. He's the ninth president and chief executive officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. He serves on the Federal Open Market Committee, the Federal Reserve System's monetary policy making body. He oversees the work of roughly 1,400 employees in Chicago and Detroit doing economic research as well as financial supervision and payments. He has served as the director of research and senior vice president and supervising the bank's research on monetary policy, banking, financial markets, and regional economic conditions previously. His research has focused on economic activity, inflation, and financial market prices. Please welcome President Evans. Thank you very much. It's uh, really uh, an honor to be here. Um, uh, thanks for inviting me. And um, uh, let me start with the standard disclaimer that these are only uh, my uh, comments and not those of uh, anyone else in the Federal Reserve uh, System. All right, so today I'd like to share with you my perspective on the evolution of uh, U.S. monetary policy since the fall of 2018, from a time when some further gradual rate increases seem to be in store to one in which cuts have been made and rates are likely to remain low for some time. I also will talk about some longer-run strategic monetary policy framework issues. Before I go into detail about policy, for context, let me just provide a brief summary of current macroeconomic conditions and my outlook for growth and inflation in the United States. Over the past year and a half, the U.S. economy has expanded at a solid 2.5% annual rate on average. One constant over this time has been strong consumer expenditures. The incoming data suggests this vitality should carry forward in the near term, reflecting healthy household balance sheets, elevated consumer confidence, and most notably, a vibrant labor market. At 3.7%, the unemployment rate is near a 50-year low. Importantly, many who had been left behind are gaining a welcome foothold into the job market, some for the first time. As labor markets have tightened, wage growth, which had been anemic for many years, finally picked up last year and has uh, maintained a solid pace so far in 2019. However, in contrast to the consumer sector, the business sector has seen some unfavorable changes. After posting robust gains last year, business fixed investment has lost considerable momentum over the past 10 months. Manufacturing output has declined and business sentiment has deteriorated. Some of this softness is a consequence of weaker foreign growth reducing the demand for U.S. products. Growth in a number of advanced and emerging economies has slowed over the past two years, and most analysts have revised down their forecasts for future growth. Furthermore, higher tariffs, the ebb and flow of trade tensions, heightened geopolitical risks and concerns over an even more pronounced and prolonged slowdown abroad have introduced a good deal of uncertainty into business decision making. A natural reaction to this uncertainty is to pull back on expansion plans. An increasing number of my business contacts, particularly those in the manufacturing sector or ones with a large international footprint, are telling me about delayed or even canceled investment projects. In addition, I've heard reports of some firms downsizing workforce plans. Putting together all of these developments, I expect the U.S. economy to grow about two and a quarter percent this year as continued strength in consumer spending offsets the weakness in business outlays and net exports. This is a solid number as it exceeds my view of the economy's long-run potential growth rate, which is slightly below two percent in the United States. Looking beyond this year, I expect growth to run roughly in line with potential. In this environment, I anticipate the unemployment rate to remain close to its current level for some time. So what about inflation? Well, inflation in the United States had been running below our symmetric 2% objective throughout most of the recovery. Then in 2018, inflation rose back to 2%. This was quite welcome, but a relatively short-lived development, as inflation subsequently faltered over the first half of 2019, falling as low as 1.5%. Currently, core PC inflation is 1.8% on a 12-month basis. In 2018, I had been reluctant to declare victory and say that our below-target inflation worries were behind us. But undeniably, the un environment at the time did seem much more favorable given the inflation improvements we'd seen. 
and I expected these improvements would continue amid a solid outlook for growth. However, the, the disappointing inflation developments this year suggest that more work is necessary. I do project that inflation will move up and then modestly overshoot 2% uh, our target over the next few years, but this requires assistance from a more accommodative monetary policy path now than I thought appropriate just last December. So let me give, uh, let me give a rationale for uh, my view of mid-cycle uh, monetary policy adjustments. The forecast for economic activity and inflation and my September submission to the Fed's quarterly summary of economic projections actually are very close to those I made at the end of 2018. Given all the developments in the United States and abroad over the past 10 months, you might wonder why my projections did not change much. Indeed, you might question whether I've been paying attention to the news at all, just submitting the same uh, forecast uh, quarter after quarter. Well, I have been reading the news and crunching the data. My staff thinks it would be funny if at this point I said, well, they've been crunching the data. I've just been reporting what they've been you know, saying. Uh, the number one reason for this stability in my outlook is that overall, the economic fundamentals remain solid. Most of the concerns over growth are about potential risks that could be costly, but also may never occur. That said, those risks appear somewhat more pronounced today. Furthermore, as I just noted, progress on inflation has been disappointing. Given this assessment, I've altered my view for the appropriate path for policy rates in order to support an outlook for continued solid growth and to boost inflation. In other words, the adjustments were made in order to keep my baseline forecast on track to meet our dual mandate goals of maximum employment and symmetric 2% inflation. This is a policy strategy I refer to as outcome-based monetary policy. As you know, my colleagues on the FOMC have made similar adjustments to their projections for the economy and the appropriate path for policy. The committee has moved through three distinct phases. First, most participants in December 2018 expected continued gradual increases in policy rates through 2019 and 2020. Then, second, participants supported holding rates constant from January through June of this year in order to assess uncertainty and evaluate uh, the developments. And then third, the committee cut rates by 50 basis points at our July and September meetings. Over this time, the FOMC's median future path of the federal funds rate went from one of gradual increases to an essentially flat and then lower funds rate through the end of next year. Chair Jay Powell characterized the July, July rate cut as a mid-cycle adjustment to policy, similar to the adjustments the FOMC had made in 1995 and 1998, and laid out three reasons for the policy move to mitigate the dampening effects of international developments on U.S. growth, to manage downside risk to the economy, and to support the return of inflation to our 2% symmetric target. To appreciate the changes in views about appropriate policy, um, I'd like to take you back uh, to the end of 2018 and talk through that. After a series of very gradual rate increases in the three years prior to December 2018, the FOMC raised the federal funds rate to the range of two and a quarter to two and a half percent in December 2018. I, along with most of my colleagues on the FOMC, thought at the time that it would likely be appropriate to raise policy rates another two or even three times in 2019. I expected this path was consistent with the sustained achievement of our dual mandate objectives of maximum employment and symmetric 2% inflation. Indeed, I projected that inflation would eventually overshoot 2% by a quarter of a percentage point or so, even with the federal funds rate target uh, range heading to three to three and a quarter percent. So we're gonna be a little bit restrictive, but we were still gonna have inflation going up above 2%. As I weighed the incoming data in the fall of 2018, two themes came into focus. First, we had the wind in our sails. The outlook for growth was good, aided in part by fiscal stimulus that some were touting as quite strong. And, as I said, I expected the inflation improvements of 2018 to continue. Recall these forecasts were made in the context of a continued long expansion dating back to 2009. Labor markets were vibrant, and the unemployment rate was somewhat below our estimate of its long-run neutral rate. 
Consumer spending was strong. Firms had invested at healthy rates in 2018, and their optimism was high, in part because of changes in the tax code and business deregulation in the United States. Foreign growth still looked relatively good at that time. True, financial market conditions had tightened some in the final few months of the year as investors became more concerned about the slowdown in growth abroad, trade tensions, and a prolonged government shutdown in the U.S. But the effects on the U.S. economy weren't seen to be that large. Forecasts were for a modest deceleration in U.S. activity, with growth in 2019 to be around 2.25%, still above the economy's underlying trend. I've already mentioned the second theme, that the inflation outlook had improved. This development requires emphasis. After underrunning our target for what was then a nine-year recovery, core PC inflation had risen and been close to 2% since February 2018. With the outlook for solid growth, a continued strong labor market, and low unemployment, there was even some potential for inflation to rise persistently above 2%. But this modest possibility of inflation above 2% needed to be balanced against the fact that inflation expectations were still too low relative to target and past experiences in which expected increases in inflation had failed to materialize. We had this expectation a few times over the previous years and it never quite came to pass. The likelihood that the inflation gains would be sustained had definitely increased, but I was still quite wary of the possibility the improvements would instead prove to be ephemeral. Together, these two plot lines argued for a removal of policy accommodation, but at a pace that was unusually gradual and would eventually leave rates only in a modestly restrictive policy stance, about 50 basis points above a neutral setting. If you could get away with setting the policy rate a mere 50 basis points above neutral at the peak of the cycle, and that would be it, that would really be an accomplishment. So that, that's how modest this setting was, in my opinion. In my view, this would have been sufficient to engineer a soft landing for the economic cycle. Again, I note that this would have been a very modest tightening by historical standards, as I felt moving too aggressively would have prevented inflation expectations from firming symmetrically around 2%. With this in mind, at the December 2018 meeting, I thought it made sense to tighten a bit further. And the FOMC did increase the range for the federal funds rate by 25 basis points to two and a quarter to two and a half percent. As we moved into the new year, some domestic and international data came in a bit softer. In addition, there were some sharp moves in equity and bond markets and an appreciation of the dollar. Apparently, financial market participants thought the risks were larger than most macroeconomic forecasters and the FOMC were thinking in December. They also may have been disappointed in Fed communications about balance sheet plans, often referred to as quantitative tightening, QT, by Fed critics. There must be Fed friends who have said QT, too. That was probably too harsh. <laughs> Regardless of the reasons, financial conditions tighten some in the U.S. With the emergence of less uniformly strong economic data and rising risks, I agreed that it made sense from a risk management perspective for the committee to pause from the expected December 2018 SEP rate path and take some more time to see how the risks would evolve before making our next policy move. Subsequently, as we went through 2019, the outlook for foreign growth weakened substantially. As I noted earlier, investment spending in the U.S. softened, and in a repeat of what has become a seemingly perennial source of frustration, inflation fell back below 2%. Some of the softness was due to what we thought were idiosyncratic transitory factors, which have since reversed. But more importantly, inflation expectations appeared to slip even further below levels, which I view as consistent with our goal. By mid-year, my assessments had changed. This takes me to my mid-cycle adjustment. I concluded that the situation called for us to cut policy rates 50 to 75 basis points below the long-run neutral rate and then leave policy on hold for a time. This was a notable change in what I judged to be appropriate policy. Within six months, I went from thinking it appropriate to eventually take policy rates 50 basis points above neutral to one where 50 basis points below neutral was in order. 
I think this more accommodative stance is needed to support a roughly similar growth outlook to what I had anticipated before, and more importantly, to support moving inflation up with greater assurance to achieve our symmetric 2% goal within a reasonable period of time. Now, I've adjusted my policy path in a way I see as most likely to yield economic outcomes consistent with our dual mandate objectives. As I have since last fall, I see economic fundamentals as being good. But the intermediate term path for monetary policy simply needed some modest repositioning in order to better align against possible risks. But beyond such adjustments, we also need to acknowledge that there is a limit to what monetary policy alone can accomplish. My outlook recognizes that the economy faces a number of important challenges today. Difficult trade negotiations over, over important long-term disagreements, slowing foreign growth, and uncertainty weighing on domestic demand. These are the types of problems that monetary policy is able to address to some degree, as more accommodative financial conditions can provide an offsetting boost to weakening aggregate demand. Furthermore, inflation is below target, and as theory tells us so forcefully, in the end, it's the monetary actions of central banks that determine the inflation rate. Now that said, there are limits to what monetary policy can do. An important reason is the effective lower bound constraint uh, and how it constrains our capacity to cut policy rates in the event of a serious downturn. Additional constraints on monetary policy effectiveness arise because we also face longer term structural issues that monetary policy has little impact on, but nonetheless have important implications for central banks. Altogether, these longer term factors point to an environment of lower trend growth and lower interest rates that is likely to persist for years in the United States. My colleagues and I have spoken frequently and in depth about these issues, so I'll be brief in explaining their causes here. An economy's long run growth is constrained by its pr productive capacity. It's a speed limit of sorts. You can exceed it for brief periods, but not forever. That capacity depends on the economy's available labor resources and on the productivity of that labor. We had a nice discussion of exactly those components yesterday. Unfortunately, demographics in the United States and in most advanced economies are working to lower the growth in labor input. Populations are aging, and in the U.S., the labor force participation rate has been on a down, downtrend for nearly 20 years. Along with slower labor force growth, the U.S. also has experienced slower growth in labor productivity. Improvements in labor quality, that is gains in education and worker experience, are no longer adding much to productivity in the U.S. Business investment has been relatively soft during this expansion, so that capital used by the workforce has increased only modestly. Likewise, despite widespread gains in technology, we've seen only modest growth in total factor productivity. Total factor productivity reflects how well we put all of our inputs together to produce output. When my research staff does the growth accounting, arithmetic, there they are crunching the numbers again for me, they expect labor hours to grow by one half a percent and labor productivity to grow by one and a quarter percent on an annual basis. This puts the sustainable growth rate of the U.S. currently at about one and three quarters percent. Now, I, you know, growth solves a lot of problems, and I think we'd all love to see growth on the order of uh, two and a half or three percent. The question is, what are the public policies that need to be implemented in order to achieve that? Currently, the economic policies seem to be aiming us at one and three quarters percent. Today's uncertain and hostile trade climate may weigh further on potential growth. This is because trade fosters cross-border competition among businesses, which in turn leads to productivity enhancement and innovation. Conversely, insulation from international market forces typically reduces a business enterprise's motivation to innovate as it faces less competition. So trend growth could be even lower than the estimate I just cited. These adverse long-term trends have enormous implications for standards of living, but there's little monetary policy can do about them. It can affect demographics, and at best has a second or third order impact on productivity trends. Other kinds of policies can 
address some of these factors, such as by ensuring a well-educated workforce, but these are the responsibility of other branches of government. That said, these trends influence the monetary policy making environment a great deal. Economic theory tells us that as the potential growth rate of the economy declines, so does the equilibrium level of real interest rates. This is the rate consistent with full employment of the economy's productive resources and is often referred to as R star. To get to the federal funds rate that is neither contractionary nor expansionary, so-called equilibrium federal funds rate, you need to add our 2% inflation target to the real R star. Today, that median estimate of my colleagues on the FOMC for that rate is 2.5%. That is significantly below the median participants' evaluation of over 4% just a few years ago. It is also below the 5% or so rate in the 2000s, as estimated by some economic models. Simply put, a lower equilibrium rate means a smaller capacity for monetary policy to counteract negative shocks to the economy. In the past, policymakers in the United States were able to provide 500 basis points of accommodation on average during an easing cycle. Today, if circumstances demand it, there's far less room to cut the federal funds rate target range before it reaches the neighborhood of zero, what we refer to as the effective lower bound on rates. The FOMC would then be forced to turn to less effective tools to provide the necessary accommodation, making it more difficult to achieve our mandated policy goals. The calculus is even more challenging if we fail to meet our 2% inflation objective, as nominal interest rates would settle out at an even lower level. That's why meeting our inflation objective is especially important. Because a low R-star environment presents practical limits on the capacity of traditional tools, the FOMC is in the process of evaluating alternative monetary policy frameworks that might be helpful in addressing the effective lower bound constraint. Uh, I don't want to prejudge the results of our discussions, but regardless of the outcome of the review, I think there's an opportunity to make better use of our current framework. Here I'm thinking specifically about the adjective symmetric that describes our 2% inflation target. The Federal Open Market Committee has stated and reaffirmed annually that, quote, the committee would be concerned if inflation were running persistently above or below the objective, unquote. I think there's room for us to better describe what symmetry means for the proactive operation of monetary policy. Let me illustrate this point with the current situation in which we have persistently underrun our inflation objective. As I noted, this may have resulted in businesses, households, and financial markets expecting inflation will underrun 2% for some time to come. In order to boost these expectations, we need to provide aggressive enough accommodation to get inflation moving up with some momentum. After all, no one ever made a free throw in basketball without enough muscle behind it to first get the ball to the hoop. This kind of force could well result in inflation modestly overrunning 2% for some time. But in the current situation, this wouldn't be a policy error. Engineering a modest overshoot of our inflation objective better guarantees that we would actually meet our inflation target in the future. Moreover, tolerating inflation as high as 2.5% does not entail much of welfare loss, especially given the lengthy undershoot we've uh, permitted already. This is because for me, more generally, symmetry means paying attention to both past and prospective misses from our target to ensure that inflation averages 2% over the long haul. In terms of a broad monetary policy strategy, I favor a powerful, full-throated commitment to, our, to follow our outcome-based monetary policies aimed at achieving maximum employment and symmetric 2% inflation within a reasonable time. The best tactics to achieve these outcomes may change over time. For example, at times this approach could prescribe forward guidance with thresholds that need to be met before adjusting rates further. At other times, it could prescribe overshooting our 2% inflation objective with momentum. The point is to focus our objectives, the point is to focus on our objectives and not on the specific operational tools used to obtain them. 
Importantly, in a world where monetary policy is challenged by low equilibrium rates and elevated odds of hitting the effective lower bound, outcome-based policy calls for a relentless focus on our symmetric 2% inflation objective throughout the cycle. We have, a, we have to have a do whatever it takes attitude toward policy all the time in a downturn when we're constrained by the effective lower bound as well as in an expansion if inflation remains stubbornly below our objective. I recognize and accept that monetary policy will never be a panacea to all the negative shocks hitting the economy. But when it comes to price stability, the monetary authority has the sole responsibility for achieving the inflation objective. For us, that's, two, that's symmetric 2% inflation. So let me conclude. To summarize, as I have for some time, I advocate for an outcome-based approach to monetary policy that would achieve our dual mandate goals on a timely basis while effectively managing various risks. Over the past 10 months, as the forces affecting the U.S. economy changed from tailwinds to headwinds, and as we lost the inflation momentum we had seemed to build, this outcome-based approach has dictated a shift in my appropriate policy path. Looking ahead, no matter which framework the FOMC adopts, I will continue to advocate for using all the available and best tools to achieve our objectives. Thanks very much. Appreciate your attention, and I look forward to your questions. George Tachos from Drexel University. What are some of the risks associated with the outcomes-based monetary approach that you so much have advocated uh, in the past uh, few years? You don't want to leave me with that? <laughs> oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Thanks very much, Pat Siegenthaler of UBS. Um, I want to ask a question about trade wars, um, given um, President Evans that you are uh, president of a district that is, uh, has a lot of manufacturing and agriculture as well. And how do you think about um, the impact uh, that the trade war has, uh, the economic impact, uh, and uh, the impact on, on confidence, which I guess is, is, is the, the part that is very hard to assess, uh, and in other uh, regions of the world, as well. So how, just looking for, for any kind of, uh, for, for insight that you might have in terms of how we should think about how these things uh, affect the economy and the outlook. Thank you. Thank you. Nain Cordemons from the National Bank of Belgium. How do you interpret the recent turmoil on the money market? To what extent is it uh, something structural? To what extent does it uh, concern um, the banking sector as a whole or some specific banks? And uh, do you think the intervention of the Fed is going to, to continue for long? Thank you. I'm oh, sorry, the, the last thing that you said? Do I the expect? intervention uh, of the, the Federal Reserve on the money market, is it yeah. going to last for long? Thank yeah. you. Sure. Um, okay, outcome-based monetary policy, I advocate sort of focusing on the objectives of what we're trying, um, you know, where we're trying to get, as opposed to just a, sort of, you know, a, a rule, something like that, where it's like, oh, let's make sure that the funds rate does this, and I have confidence that that rule is going to get me to where it's supposed to go. I'm not always sure that those rules are robust enough. Some of them are robust, I suppose, across a wide variety of models, but uh, in general, we've had a very hard time getting inflation up to 2%. So I think you always have to keep your eye on the objectives um, and keep pushing beyond what a rule might say uh, if you're not meeting those objectives. I mean, after all, think about an interest rate rule that's got an intercept. The intercept is going to be uh, related uh, to the real um, interest rate, uh, moves around over time. How much confidence do you have that the intercept is uh, appropriately set in that rule? And so it you know, could be restrictive at a time when you think actually it's quite accommodative. So uh, I think you have to focus on the outcome comes quite a lot. Uh, what are the risks to that? Well, um, it's not an easy interest rate rule, right? So you might prefer rules over discretion. Uh, I guess I asked if you were going to lead me a little bit more because some people I know, trained economists, would go, well, this sounds like discretionary monetary policy. You're just calling this outcome-based uh, monetary policy, but it sort of sounds like a loss function that you're going to minimize and choose um, policies. 
over time. And to some extent, I suppose, it has that element, but I think that um, building up reputational uh, credibility, hitting your objectives, when there's enough trust from everyone that you're uh, you know, headed for your inflation objective and you've indicated you know, what you mean by symmetry. So you know, it's not less than two, it's not three all the time or things like that. As you flesh that out and explain in an experience, I think that the reputation and credibility that comes with that overcomes any uh, small risks that might come from discretionary policy. Um, trade wars, what's the impact? You know, one thing that's always interesting, um, talking with, uh, you know, the staff, I'm not an international economist by training, and it seems that when presented with um, unusual scenarios outside of international, the joke that we have around, you know, the bank is, well, this just happens. What do you think the effect on GDP is? And sort of measured the right way, the answer is usually two-tenths. Two-tenths to GDP growth or, you know, something like that. It's usually pretty small. And if you look at the, the tariffs and the trade and you've got a lot of netting that takes place in the ultimate analysis, um, you know, the effects on U.S. GDP from, you know, these tariffs and higher tariffs is, you know, it's not, it's not positive, but it's, it's not really a large number. Now, what gives me pause and the way that I would think about your question is um, economics is a lot about net demand, net supply. We're not so good at gross relationships. Economic activity is a lot of gross inputs finding their way into value added. And so when businesses have to stop and think about the supply chain that they put in place and they had high confidence that NAFTA would be around for a long period of time, so they're willing to put you know, uh, supply operations into Mexico at the border, into Canada at the border, and they know they're going to cross over a lot of times. If now all of a sudden the world changes and that becomes costly, and geez, we just had a conference at our Detroit branch on uh, auto supply chains, and uh, Thomas Clear, my colleague, described uh, seatbelts. And, you know, from the original material that could be produced in North Carolina and moving it down to Mexico, moving it back up to some operation operation in the U.S. and you go back and forth, you could go 16 times across the border and how is that tariff going to be applied and at, at times it was, you know, sort of kind of questionable in terms of the cost. And so I think the, 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 the focus on confidence and uncertainty sort of adds another dimension to that. So it's, it's, it's a risk that we need to be paying attention to. Fundamentals look good for the U.S. and if there's a resolution of some sort in, in you know, so many of these trade relationships, then that's the navigation through this period that could work fairly well. But there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, money markets. Money markets have been, um, um, you know, quite an area of uh, interest, uh, you know, at the quarter end, and it turns out that, uh, um, you know, in the short term, uh, financing uh, markets and uh, general collateral repo and other types of short term money markets, uh, spread, um, the rates uh, went up. There was um, a lot of uh, corporate tax payments on particular dates, and the act of making those payments sucks reserves out of a bank and then they end up somewhere else not available for repo activity and um, you know that combined with some other quarter end type of uh, you know issues for funding sort of let those spreads uh, those interest rates uh, move up at the same time the FOMC has been reducing has reduced the size of our balance sheet from you know a very large uh, number to one that still is ample reserves I, I would say but you know there's a question as to what's the right amount of reserves in order to make the liquidity uh, ample during periods of these types of, of payments. And so uh, I think we learned a lot from this. Uh, there, there are a bunch of questions that I think anybody could ask about this. You know, one thing is these, these repo rates, they sort of moved around over time and they're somewhat related to uh, the increase in treasury rates. With the increase in uh, government deficits and the treasury financing deficits, it would make sense in some sense if those things moved up a little bit over time so the relationship of these rates to our funds rate target you know could be changing one would guess slowly 
with the Treasury financing operation. So it's the volatility that seems to be most bothersome in this. Um, and I think that uh, the New York Fed has worked uh, very hard, uh, uh, provided some strong programs to intervene, provide more, um, um, you know, uh, more reserves on a daily basis than term uh, over the quarter end. And so I think we're going to uh, learn from this and, and try to understand better what's the size of the balance sheet and reserves, which uh, best uh, provides for you know an assured financial stability in those markets. So we're going to be studying that more, or at least I'm going to. I'm not the expert in that. Time for one more round of questions. Let's take three. Kathleen Stephenson, GIC. Uh, so do we understand low inflation? And what are the dynamics behind that? And is monetary policy response the only way that we can tackle this low inflation situation? Which role does the exchange rate play in the Fed's monetary policy considerations? And if it plays any role, which kind of exchange rate effective, uh, euro dollar, whatever? Uh, you've described the challenges of a central bank at the effective lower bound. Uh, how would you assess uh, the euro system experiment of negative rates? Is that an instrument that should be considered in the United States too? Three? Okay, all right. Um, yeah, let me go backwards. So um, the effective lower bound, yeah, I've been, you know, I was research director before I became president in uh, 2007. I've been president for 12 years, going through the zero lower bound uh, period, 2008 and in the U.S. and the great financial crisis. It, it, it strikes me that with all of the um, monetary training I had from graduate school and working at the Fed, um, you know, we needed a lot more preparation to understand zero lower bound, effective lower bound issues and how to provide accommodation when you were uh, at the bound. Um, you know, Ben Bernanke was a student of the Great Depression, uh, an expert in financial markets. I thought he came into the job as a governor, quite well prepared, as chair, quite well prepared, and he thought very carefully about a number of different liquidity programs and navigated that very well. We did, uh, you know, lots of large-scale asset purchases and um, other liquidity programs. Negative interest rates were negative, never something that was... Um, uh, taken up, certainly not taken up. Uh, discussed, maybe, lightly, probably. Uh, the, the committee probably spent very little time talking about uh, negative interest rates. And um, I kind of marveled at other central banks that did implement that and have found that uh, to be useful. I mean, I think in principle, you know, the whole point of this is to make uh, the cost of... Uh, the cost of funds cheaper uh, for banks or to incent them to go out and lend rather than, you know, to get taxed on their reserves. And so it all works in the right direction. It's just uh, kind of difficult to implement. I, I kind of worry that in the future, banking system wasn't able to anticipate this. And so we're living through how they experience it. The next time around, if they have a chance to reposition themselves, I would worry that they would try to defend against it so that it would be less effective. So I think those are some of the challenges. But I also think that one of the most important things a central banker does when facing the effective lower bound is they get up and they talk about all the things that they're going to do and how they're going to keep doing it because they're convinced that they're going to get you know, their, their goal, get to their goal variables. So uh, the exchange rate for monetary policy, um, back in my younger days, I used to fall uh, back on uh, the old joke, which was true policy, that when it comes to questions about the U.S. dollar, you know, that's not the central bank, that's the province of the U.S. Treasury, so um, I can't answer that question. Um, 
We used to say that about interest rates too. We can't talk about interest rates. Then forward guidance became monetary policy tools. So uh, that one fell by the wayside too. Uh, you know, in terms of monetary policy, uh, you know, we always have to take note of financial market pricing and um, trade flows and what it means for demand implications for the U.S. and things like that, relative prices and that. But you know, in terms of uh, desirability of certain levels of exchange rates or anything like that, that really um, doesn't come up. It's really, where do we think exchange rates are going? How does that Im how does that affect our forecast? What's embedded in that? And so we're just looking at the implications of that. Um, ah, lastly, do we understand low inflation? <clears throat> um, I would say, I mean, we, we probably don't. I think inflation is, um, it depends on what the question really is. I mean, do we understand inflation determination? How do we forecast inflation? When confronted with low inflation, is it really a problem or is it just sort of bad data and, and things like that? I, I take seriously that the price indices that we have indicated, we've got an objective, we're there to hit it. That's what we're supposed to be doing, that they measure inflation adequately enough. I don't think inflation, I personally don't think when the inflation data show it to be low, in fact, it's higher. But I get questions like that all the time. I think it's natural for people to sort of ignore the fact that there's a whole host of prices that are falling all the time. Digital uh, equipment, phones, um, computers, all kinds of things. You just, you accept that, you pocket it, and you only look at the prices that are going up. But the index is weighing all of those things. I mean, at the end of the day, if you don't like uh, price indices or things like that, I sort of step back and I go, well, financial markets are telling me that long-term interest rates, 10-year treasury rates are low, and you know, there's a lot of important people who have you know, serious resources, capital at stake, and if inflation's actually a lot higher and they're not being compensated for it, they're doing something wrong. So since I assume they feel they're being adequately compensated, that's in line with inflation being low. We need to figure out how to get it up. It's a monetary uh, central bank. Uh, mission. That's what monetary economics is all about. It's not a fiscal issue. If inflation were 6%, I don't get to go, it's not my problem. I can't do anything about it. If inflation is 1%, I don't get to say that either. So thanks very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure.